Hello and welcome to the Upon Further Review podcast, brought to you by Field Street Baptist Church. On this podcast, your host, Cody Kitchen, sits across the table from Pastor John Hall as he reviews his Sunday sermon from the week before. Welcome to Upon Further Review podcast. I am your host, Cody Kitchen, and joined with me, as always, is Dr. John Hall. Good afternoon. We are Continuing our series in Luke verse by verse, and this week we were in Luke chapter 12, verse 22 through 34, with the title of the message, A Word to Those Who Worry. So as always, our first question, John, as you prepared this message, what are some things that came to mind? It struck me the perfect timing of this text. Hmm. I am frequently... In awe, I suppose, of God and how he orchestrates the timing of a text with what we may have going on in our personal lives, our families, community, the nation, world. Mm. And certainly this particular text would qualify under the heading of a perfect timing. Also... I think it's obvious that these days we live in currently provoke worry. Mm. Well, I think all of us are worried about something. I, don't, I do not know how you avoid that completely. Having said that, I think that what Jesus says in this text are nuggets of of loving, wise counsel, if we will apply those words. And that's a lot easier said than done. That, those were my first thoughts. That's good. And you even started off your message with the statement that we're all prone to worry. And I love how practical this message is. And once again, I think as always, especially as we've seen it, how pointed Jesus is on the importance of not to worry. And so I wanted to spend a short time that we have together to discuss your message a little further. And so your first point was that you pointed out that Jesus tells us, do not worry, in verses 22 and 23. And you stated on Sunday that Jesus is pretty straightforward. And you make the point that the Heavenly Father loves us with a love that is incomprehensible. And you describe this love in 12 ways that scriptures talk about it. And so quickly, if that's okay, I want to go over each of the ones that you talked about, because I I believe that the weight of these verses should hit us hard to understand the love of God. And so the first one you talked about where love is a love that is lavishing in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, a love that is faithful in Psalms 86, verse 15, a love that is steadfast also in Psalms, I'm sorry, yeah, 86, 15, a love that is sacrificial in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, a love that is eternal, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, a love of which nothing can separate us, Romans 8, 35, a love that casts out fear, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, a love which disciplines, Hebrews t- chapter 12, verse 6, a love which reciprocates, in Proverbs 8, 17, a love which gives, John 3.16, a love that compelled him to adopt us. We see this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And a love that says, cast your cares on me. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. I love that you listed these verses because it proves that God loves us and cares for us that we have no need to worry. And I thought it was just genius in the way that you brought in those verses because they're from Scripture, and so they're obviously true, in the truth that comes from the Scripture. And so my question is focused on the ones who struggle with the fact that God loves them, is how can our listeners trust and believe that God loves them? That's a good question. And I suppose the short answer is, generally speaking, people need to stop that. (laughs) Really. Because 
it's settled already yeah. that God loves us, and he has a special love for those who are in his son, Christ. And so my statement would be simply, you have to trust his word at some point. And then the, the strongest argument I can make for trying to convince people that God does love them, especially those he has called to his son Christ, is the cross. I mean, the cross is exhibit A. It is the most profound declaration of the love of God. Hmm. Not only did he give his son, but also his son, in obedience to the Father's will, voluntarily obediently laid down his life and shed his blood so that those who will repent and believe might be saved through him. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how God could do any more to convince us of his love. So if we still feel, which I don't always trust my feelings, if we still feel and we are not yet convinced of God's love for us, I don't know what more could be said and or done. The, the love of God is so convincing. Mm. And the extraordinary links that God went to to establish and identify and persuade us of his great love for us, a love we don't deserve, is profound. And... I am reminded any time I walk by a cross in a church like our own of the love of God. But not only the love of God, you can also say the severity of God. Mm. And it is at the cross we have the intersection of God's love and his severity and love triumphed in, in Christ's death on the cross and certainly when God raised his son back to life by his power it's a profound declaration of God's love. So I'm really, I don't know that I could offer a five-step, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, and you'll be convinced of God's love. Mm. Read the Bible, trust what God is saying, and then look to the cross. That's good. And I appreciate that answer, and I think that's as honest as we can get. <laughs> and so I appreciate it. And sure. it's just one of those things that, We've talked about this before on this podcast is I don't think our finite <laughs> minds can fully ever comprehend it here on this side of earth. And no. so uh, that's why I say I really appreciate that answer because it's just true. And <laughs> it is, is a belief that we have to know and look back to through scripture. So, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the second question, which, um, or I'm sorry, the second point that you talked about and pointed out was that Jesus reminds us of our value to God in verses 24 in 28 of Luke chapter 12. And you point out that Jesus speaks of ravens, and if God feeds and takes care of them, how much more will he take care of us? In Jesus' illustration also about the lilies, which is pointing to the truth that if God clothes the lilies, how much more will he clothe us? And your point is that God cares about his children, so why do we worry? So we're, we're told not to worry and given reason not to worry. So my question are what are practical ways that we can grow in our trust in God and give him our worries? Two ways. One, I think most of us would receive with an open mind and the other no one is going to like. I'm fine with that. <laughs> so first, I would say one of the ways that we grow to trust the Lord uh, to meet our needs and to help alleviate worrying about our needs is really to trust him to meet our needs one at a time. And as you see, God's faithfulness to meet your needs and you begin to look back over the history of your life, however long it might be, you will see the faithfulness of God. And I could give testimony after testimony of how God has met my needs through the years, has met the needs of my family, my children, 
my wife and I, and I have watched him again and again and again, sometimes right at the midnight hour, meet our needs. And I can testify to the faithfulness of God. A practical way, and this will be a, a challenge for all of us, and some will not necessarily like this, at least on the front end, if you want to see God meet your needs, then I would challenge all of our listeners to start with your finances mm. and commit to giving a tithe of everything God gives to you in income. Give 10% of it back to Him. And I guarantee you, you will see God meet your needs. I'm not going to go out and say He's going to meet those needs financially. He might. But he has not obligated himself to that. I'm not a prosperity, health and wealth, nonsense, gospel peddler. Thank you. But I will say that I cannot find any instance in the Scripture where God did not bless obedience. So if you will obey and take God at his word and obey his command and you give, and I would challenge our listeners to give 10%, start there. And that is a practical way for you to develop a spiritual muscle where you trust and learn to trust God to meet your needs. And if, if our listeners will do that, I, I can almost guarantee it, you, you will begin to see, again, the faithfulness of God to meet your needs. That's the qualifier, <laughs> needs. And I've also discovered Along the way, sometimes God does grant us our desires, but he's only obligated himself to meeting our needs. So practically speaking, if you want to grow in your trust of God, start giving him a portion of your income. Amen. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's jhall at fieldstreet.com. Oh, I would be, I'd be interested to know if anyone emailed you on that one. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get some. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so good. And I I agree with you. And I think there's that is such a good reminder even for all of us that um, so many times I think we, <laughs> we, we expect, you know, God to meet our needs, which we should. But I think sometimes we get confused what our needs are and what our wants are mm -hmm. in that. And so I think it, it was, for me, too, it was just a good reminder that, if he clothes the lilies and takes care of the ravens, how much more will he take care of us? And yes. so that's so good. And, and I want to transition into the, the last thing that Jesus tells us in these verses, which is believers are to have a very different focus regarding the pursuits of life. Verse 29 through 34. And the last statement gives us as believers what we are to do. And you pointed out that in verse 31, and I loved this, and it tells us to seek his kingdom. And you said this, quote, you can have only one right ruler, king of your life, Jesus Christ. You must give him control over, over every area of your life, not just your Sunday life, but all of your life, your work, play, relationship, plans, all of it, end quote. And he pointed out the answer of what we are to do in verse 33 and 34, which is to invest in God's kingdom, which is what you were just talking about. And you make that point that Jesus is not saying the earthly treasures are bad, but that they will not last. And you also said, quote, make it a habit to remember that you are a steward of what really belongs to God. And you will most likely be in step with his desire and purpose for what he has entrusted to you, end quote. I love that you said that and that even the, the word steward and what steward means. And so my question is, how can we practically invest in the things of God in our lives? Excellent question, Cody. And first, I would respectfully suggest... You have to make a plan, and then you commit to that plan. And again, I know I sound like an echo. Uh, I sound like I'm in an echo chamber. You have to read the Bible. Mm. You just have to read it uh, to discover how God wants us 
to invest this one and only life that he's given us. Now, practically speaking, and again, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> if you want to discover how you can more practically invest in the things of God, then my great suggestion would be you need to go on an international mission trip. Come on. We here in the United States even, and I say this with some reluctance, but uh, even among what we would consider the poorest of the poor, we're pretty well outfitted when you compare to other places in the world. Now, I know that's not across the board true, so there's, I, I don't want to get into a big debate about that, but nothing opened my eyes to see how good I have it, like traveling to India, mm-hmm. Cuba. I've traveled to the Philippines, to the Dominican Republic, and the Lord, particularly in India, opened my eyes to how good I have it. And if you want to start investing your life in eternal matters, Nothing, I think, will stir that more in your heart than to be around people who they don't have nothing. Mm. Pardon me. They have nothing, and you saw as well as I have seen in the DR, children who don't even have a mattress to sleep on. Children who light up like a Christmas tree when they're given a pair of shoes. And, And all of us, we have multiple pairs of shoes. We spend hundreds of dollars on a mattress we're, we're we're really blessed and i think sometimes we don't see it like we need to see it until we step outside of our context and we get blinded by the fact well i don't have what my neighbor has or i don't have what someone else has and i start getting you know melancholy about it or jealous of it or envious of it and none of that needs to be in any of our hearts as followers of Christ and then you step outside your comfort zone like here in the US and you go to some place in the world and you realize wow I mean I have running water I can drink out of the tap I have a toilet I can flush I have food in my pantry I haven't even touched and so I just think part of it is having maybe a different perspective on what God has given us, I think it awakens something in our hearts to be A, more appreciative, and B, more willing to say, how can I begin investing what God has given me, which is a lot, in ways that matter for the kingdom, the ways that matter to help and improve someone else's life who they can't do it, so we need, they need the Christian community to step up and say, I'm going to share out of my abundance. Mm -hmm. And who of us can't do that? So it's one thing when people who are impoverished share. We should be ashamed or at least admire that. But those of us who are truly blessed, and that would be probably all of us listening, certainly the person yapping into the microphone at the moment, I'm blessed. I think we have a responsibility to, to share what God has given us. And and that will help unfasten us from hanging on to worldly possessions that ultimately, what does Jesus say, rust and moth can destroy. I, I think Jesus is just lovingly brilliant to redirect our focus where we store our treasure. And we need to be storing it in heaven. And and may God help us not to not to catch on to that too late in our lives. May we catch on to it now so whatever time we have left here on earth, we're leveraging it better for the kingdom. That's good. That's really good. And I, I, I'm i thankful that you brought up the DR because I think that's a mission trip that <laughs> practically a lot of us can go on mm-hmm. that can truly change our lives to see how many believers across the world, and not just in the DR, as you said, other places as well, but to see what they have and how they worship God. And I don't want to say this in a comparison way because that's not my heart, but in almost in a more full way in the sense of they don't have anything Mm -hmm. and they have nothing to compare that to. Mm -hmm. And so it's different when all you think you have is God. 
Absolutely. I mean, we have God mm. and. Mm. And I hope it doesn't come down to this, but what if our lives were reduced to what many believers in the world, they don't know anything other than what their life is. And we do. And uh, as, as, sometimes our affluence is a real barrier to our growth in Christ. And, and I can, you know, I'm speaking from experience too on that. Re- regrettably, and I'm not a proud of that, but um, sometimes having stuff is a real problem. Absolutely. To our spiritual growth, that doesn't need to be, and we don't need to allow it to be, but it, it certainly can be if we're not paying attention. So pardon me for interrupting. No, that's good. And all I was, I was just going to finish and just an encouragement, and I know the message to me was an encouragement in this way, in this way is to, again, and we've said this before on this podcast, is we as God's people have to step up, and especially in the world that we're in today of, of seeing just – truth being taken where it's not truth and um, things being said that aren't true is we as God's people who have the truth need to take that truth seriously and take it to the city of Cleburne. It's just as broken as any part of this world and we're in it and we're living it daily lives. And so my encouragement, as you even said, is that that we just continue to read God's word, but also use what God has given us through his word and the gifts that he has given us, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and love the people that he has put into our lives and show them the gospel, Mm -hmm. simply. And so as we transition into our closing um, statements, John, what are some of your final thoughts, some last words? Well, my final thoughts would be, really, I guess I'm talking to myself. Y'all are welcome to over over, over here. Uh, really taking to heart Jesus' admonition to not worry. Hmm. Do not worry. And then also uh, to be more committed to this idea of thinking more carefully and letting my thinking inform how I act, this, the decisions I make, steps I take, so to speak, that I'm, I'm genuinely more focused on where I'm storing my treasure and I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm very much aware that more of my life is behind me than is in front of me. And it's a shame that it takes that aging process to awaken us to, you know, what really matters in life and what doesn't. And I think, you know, when we're younger, we, we chase after things that ultimately don't matter. And hopefully we awaken to that sooner than later so that we're, you know, putting, you know, our investment vehicle is really in the kingdom and we're storing up treasure in heaven. And, you know, we just probably need to think more about that. I know I do. I've been thinking about it a lot the last couple of days about what really matters, what lives on beyond us, what what's going to matter. And I don't think it's going to matter. Some of the things we really get caught up in and commit to chasing and does it, in the long run and for the kingdom sake, uh, does it matter? So there's a lot going on in this text of scripture and probably all of us would do well again to circle back to it and just read it and remind ourselves first, you know, I don't need to worry. Mm. If God's taking care of birds and lilies, he's surely gonna take care of me. And boy, there's some lessons there. I think Jesus was a master in his teaching. Uh, I so appreciate that. Absolutely. Well, guys, we hate to say that we're, it's time to conclude this episode, but it's time to conclude this episode. And as always, we're so thankful that you join us every week. And so to end this session, remember, make Christ known by what you say and how you live. Y'all have a great week. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you all for listening. Be sure to subscribe to Upon Further Review so you never miss an episode. If you have any questions, please be sure to reach out to us at info at fieldstreet.com. Thanks for tuning in.